Hi, I'm Roisin Ingle and I'm here in Farmley Estate as part of Dublin City Library's Reader's Morning at Dublin Book Festival and I am delighted to be here chatting with the amazing Marion Keyes. Hello Marion. Hi Roisin. Now everyone will know you for your 35 million books sold, books like Rachel's Holiday, Watermelon, The Break and Grown Ups which is your latest one which was hugely successful and we're going to talk all about that but first of all I have to ask you about lockdown because I've been talking to quite a few writers over the last six or seven months and asking them about what it's been like for, for them for creativity and a lot of writers are saying sure that's my normal life I'm locked down all the time I'm on my own in my garret writing but what's it been like for you in terms of getting the writing done and what kind of effect has it had on you in terms of creativity? I mean it's true what a lot of writers say that that you know being on our own is our normal life but our feelings aren't normal and haven't been normal um, and initially it was incredibly difficult for me, like I couldn't concentrate at all, like I couldn't make anything up or I couldn't believe in what I was writing. And I know I've said this often, but there's a reason, because we're all in fight or flight mode, so we're all, our, our, our kind of our logical brain is the only part that we will let work because um, we need to keep ourselves safe, like we're scanning the horizon, like we're looking for predators. And that means that the imaginative side didn't work at all for me. And it also meant like, you know, loads of people have been talking about having really vivid dreams at this time. So like we'd be kind of so conscious and present and sentient all day. And then we'd go to bed and the imaginative part of our brain is only allowed to work then. So I got nothing done for ages. And, and you know, I think if it's your job to make things up, it's very weird when you can't. Um, but then I got into a really lovely rhythm, I don't know, maybe you know, six weeks in or something. And it was kind of, I mean, I'm an introvert anyway, so it did sort of suit me yeah. that I had to be alone in the house all the time. And the makey up part of my head was working grand. And then I hit a huge wall and it was a huge shock. I realised I was craving people. Like I was missing rowdiness and going out and being at yokes with lots of people and, and shouting across the room and saying, I'll be over to you in a minute. Like, and I think, I mean, for me anyway, because I write about people, I, I need to actually spy on social interaction, even if I can't be part of it. So that was tricky. Um, so I, things haven't been going as well. Um, I keep saying, right, okay, this coming Monday, it, it's all starting again. It hasn't really happened yet. But no, I mean, I think, this has been really challenging for everyone, like regardless of their job. And so what about your process then, the little bits that you have managed to do? I think people are always really interested in the rituals and the way people write. So are you a get up in the morning, get onto your desk? You have a book called Under the Duvet, um, yeah. which is your non-fiction work, which is a collection of columns. And that, that's called Under the Duvet because you're in your bed. But are you, you're not still writing in your bed, are you? No. I'm like, very impressed. That's great. Well, <laughs> I mean, I loved, I mean, like I would never get up, you know, unless I really had to. Like my bed is the place where I feel safe. And like I loved having a job where I just I never had to get dressed or anything. And people used to say, "Oh no, you can't write in bed. You'll 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 wreck your back." And I used to think, "No, I won't wreck my back. I am stronger than that. I can defy <laughs> these medical things." Anyway, I did wreck my back, and uh, and then I had to get a special chair made for me. Um, and no, so I have a little desk in the spare bedroom, and I'm I'm mornings if I don't kind of, I'm not good at starting at three o'clock in the day. It's too late then. So I'm, I'm mornings until I sort of run out of energy and, and, and then in the afternoon there's always other stuff to do not related to whatever book I'm working on. Like Twitter. Like, Twitter! Now, th yes, exactly. And lately Instagram as well, yes. I mean, they are very, very urgent pieces yes, of work. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, it's awful. I'm so distractible. Um, but I suppose I feel that I have only so much 
energy on a particular on, on any day or so much kind of creative so many words that's what it is um on any day and also it's that kind of thing that they're not cumulative like if i don't use them today they won't carry over till tomorrow mm. it's just a kind of a, a one-off thing every day so it's kind of worth my while to try and do it mm. every day and how has your mental health been in lockdown as well because that's something else you have been so helpful to people about in normalizing it and thank god for um the fact that we talk about it more like it's a normal thing because it is it's like anything else any other health issue that we have so how did lockdown affect you in that way um oh all kinds of ways like uh i mean to be honest i mean my first huge worry was when all the aa meetings started to close and i was thinking you know i i won't be able to stay sober without them um but they're all on Zoom. Like, it's fabulous. You know, that has been such a help. And then, like, I've gone through, like, you know, the fear of everyone I love dying. You know, like, my mother is vulnerable. And, and then I thought, you know, I'm not that young anymore. You know, like, I still think I'm, like, 17, but I'm not. And, like, there's that shock of kind of realising, oh, my God, I'm in my late 50s, and so is my husband. And, you know... That's kind of shocking. It's been up and down. Um, it hasn't been great. I don't think it has for anyone. You know, and I've had times when it's been fine because I've managed to pretend it's not really happening. Um, but I've always been aware that, like, that there are options if it gets too bad. Like, you know, going back on a higher dose of the anti-mads or antidepressants, as some of us like to call them. Um, you know, and you know, to kind of be aware that like, there's no shame in the fact that like, yeah, there's a global pandemic going on and everything feels a bit odd. You know, the wise person said to me, you know, because I was freaking out about like not being able to do the amount of work I'd normally do. And she was like, the love of Jesus, you know, there's a global pandemic going on. Why are we expecting ourselves to function as usual? So that was a great help. Mm. So you didn't learn to play the ukulele? I didn't, and I, I, although my conversational Korean is coming along very slowly. I'm delighted to hear. Well, you are playing the ukulele. Yes, I learned the ukulele in lockdown. Oh my <coughs> God. Yes, thank you very much. You and my conversational Korean is excellent as well. Oh, yeah, I'm um, a failure. Yeah, that's, you know. I'm, I, I didn't use, I didn't maximise my, <laughs> my lockdown free time. But no, in fairness, you have written 14 books in your life, so I think you're okay. You don't need to do anything else. Speaking of which, Grown Ups is your latest, and it was so successful, and it was number one, and you know, it got such a great, great feedback. That must be brilliant. I mean, because yeah. you've been doing it a while, and every time it must be kind of the anticipation of the yeah. audience that you're writing yeah. for. Yeah, I mean, it has. It was a really lovely. It was a lovely publication. It was a lovely, like it really was. Yeah, because you never know, and like I'm such a, a pessimist. That I, you know, at the beginning, when my first book came out and people were nice about it, I, you know, I thought that that's really incredibly kind of them, but they don't have to do it a second time. It's <laughs> fine. They've done it once and I really enjoyed it. So I've been constantly waiting for, I don't know, the other shoe to drop. But this, the publication of Grown Ups, people were so, you know, the kind of the friends of your mothers that you'd meet now and again. And they'd say, aren't you a great girl now? And like, I, you know, I don't read your books now. They're not for me <laughs> at all. I just, you know, they're not for me. I just don't like them. I love you the know? way they have to tell you yeah, that. It's yeah. great, And I it? tried one in particular and the <laughs> language offended me so much. And like, but, but these women who would be very open about my, the, my flaws and failings, they were like, that was a good book. Do you know, that was a good girl, Marion. You did that well. There was something different about it, and I think it's just the fact that I've been doing this for for 25 years. And I think you learn things on the job. And there was something about it, I think maybe the, the, the huge age range of the characters, that there was something for everybody. Um, it just had a wider appeal, I think. And one reviewer, I think it was the Guardian, who <gasps> still my beating heart, oh my goodness. called it a mature book. Wow. And it was like, you know, and it did feel a bit mature. Yeah. You know, and if, I suppose this is, I don't know, maybe interesting. It's probably the least funny of all my novels. And, mm. it, and it wasn't deliberate, but people have been urging me 
people like the friends of my mother's, you know, who would say, now, Ruth, all that humour and laughing. Marion, if you could just tone it down a bit, people would take you more seriously. Maybe well, they were right. Well, Maybe I'm, they were right. I'm not sure about that anyway. I think uh, But the thing is, it is what it is. And I exactly. didn't write the book thinking, I want to appeal to people or I'll tone down the humour. Yeah. I think it's just one of those happy accidents. I write all my books with as, as well as I can. Yeah. And sometimes something does... You me, certainly weren't writing for the friends of your man. No, you know, but no. It's great that they liked it. I'm it delighted. was great. <laughs> um, but it is a sprawling book, like you said, a big family, big messy family. And it starts with the one of the characters having a bang to the head. And as a result, it starts telling the truth which is something that in life you don't always want to be doing, telling people what they what you really think instead of what they'd like to hear. Yeah. And that's based on a real thing that happened to one of your friends. Yeah, no, it was a woman I worked with. She was um, one of my publicists and she got concussion. And she was suddenly, I thought she'd had a personality change initially because she was really narky. <laughs> and she, you know, and in professional situations, especially, you have to pretend to be nice even if you're in bad form. And, and she was, and she was like, oh, no, no, I don't like that. No, I don't want to sit here. No, I don't, no, no, you know. And she was, I was thinking, what on earth is wrong with her? And it came out like a couple of days later that she had concussion. And suddenly she had no filter. So she wasn't able to do that kind of social veneer that we all do. Or the lies. I, I don't even know if lies are the word. Half-truths. Yeah, kind the, of a dishonest, the niceties. Yeah, yeah. a dishonest honest version of ourselves that yeah. we put out there in the world in order to kind of smooth social and professional interactions. Yeah, exactly. And so this happened and it inspired you to kind yeah, of create something. I just thought, because I think in any group of people, whether it's work people or a family or a group of friends, there will be things that you can't say. You know, somebody will drive you mad. You know, a particular thing they do will drive you insane. And you know that you can't say it because it will cause a row or it'll open a gap or it'll wound them in a way that it, it'll rupture things in a way that can't be repaired. Mm. Or there will be other times when you feel very inappropriately fond of another person. And you can't say that either because either it'll be misconstrued or else it won't be misconstrued. Mm. And and you have opened a situation. So I was interested in all the things that go on beneath the surface, those kind of snarly little flashpoints that are kept tamped yeah. down by the veneer of, I don't know, white lies or whatever. Yeah, I thought, well, what if something got in there and started bringing them all to the surface? Like, would it help? Um, would the truth set us free? Or... Or was, is the chaos kind of created, is that just too, too uncomfortable? And it's all those skeletons and secrets yeah. in a family and, that and everybody yes. has. And everybody... Of course, I not think, our families, everybody else's family. Well, the thing is, you see, I think everybody has this kind of secret chamber in their heart that they think, my family is really, really dysfunctional. <laughs> totally. We are, like, particularly odd yeah. in the most unglamorous, embarrassing, shameful ways. They don't make funny stories. Like, it's not good or attractive. I think everybody feels like that. There's things that we do that really I wouldn't want anyone to know about. But actually, every family is like that. You know, even the shiniest, glossiest, best-looking, Calvin Klein-wearing, <laughs> polite, nice-teeth-having <laughs> families. You know, every family. I think it's impossible for any group of people to be sort of linked without, without an awful lot of texture. Mm. And you mentioned age gaps as well. So Jesse is the oldest character and then there's Nell, the youngest. And it's interesting their priorities as women at the different stages of their lives. You were interested in that too. Yeah. I mean, like Jesse is, she has her 50th birthday in the book and Nell is 30. And they are like light years apart from each other because Jesse is, I mean, I've never really uttered this before, but I feel she'd vote Fina Gale. You know, I'm awfully sorry, but like she'd be, you know, she was the kind of the party who get up early in the morning, you know, the hard work and the pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps and that like, 
I mean, okay, Jessie is good to her staff, and Jessie would never think pe poor people are poor because they deserve it, you know. But she would have that kind of, she's not bleeding heart in any way, that it's all about you get what you deserve, and if you don't have it, you don't deserve it. And I mean, and she is like this arch consumer, like she defines herself by how much money she spends. And also it's how she kind of, it's how she shows her love and how she sort of shackles people to her as well by spending money. Whereas Nell is a millennial, she's worried about the planet, you know, because she'll be living on it after Jessie is gone. Um, and Nell is, she doesn't buy new clothes, um, she, like, she loves her job, she's a theatre set designer, but even that is something quite, it's quite, not intangible, but it doesn't last, mm. you know, and she's not in it for the money, she's in it for the passion of, like, creating something beautiful. Um, and, like, she was inspired by my beloved niece, Emma, who I talk about a lot, who is, who's younger than Nell, Emma is 20. But I just thought it was funny that, I mean, 20 years maybe isn't that much between the two women, but their priorities are enormously different. Yeah. And, and I think, I honest, I mean, I do think there is this schism. I know there's always generation gaps and that like the young people think the older people are like a crowd of clueless fools who are, you know, out of touch and, and know nothing. But I actually think there is a, there is a, a real gap between, I suppose, the under 30s mm. and say, I don't know, the over 45s. And it is about the future of the planet. Yeah, it also makes me think on, on a different note about that age gap, about what we think when we're 30 and how it changes. And I'm just thinking yeah. about Catelyn Moran's book, um, More <gasps> Than yes. a Woman. Yeah. And in her book, she talks about how in How To Be A Woman, which was the big, huge, successful feminist tome, um, she talked about you know how Botox wasn't good and she wouldn't think it was very feminist. But in this book, um, just it's out now actually. She's talking about how she's had Botox I and know. how she looked at her. You know, some people have resting bitch face, and she yeah. just felt she looked tired all the time. And yeah. a little bit of Botox has kind of helped her. And she's she's sort of admitting that she was you know she wrong. thought one thing. Yeah, she's yeah. wrong. And as she got older, she had a different perspective. And I think ch her changing her mind is really interesting. And you've spoken about yeah. uh, that as yeah. well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like all of that, like I absolutely loved. I mean, it was such a relief when she said that she'd had Botox. It was like, oh my God, if she's had it, like we can all, we can all come out, come down from the hills, you know? Yeah, because I had always said that I wouldn't have Botox for, for, for lots of reasons. One, because, well, when I said it, I was younger. Yeah, and I, was That's, like, I think that was yeah. Patton's thing. It's as well. like, what's wrong with getting old? You know, blah de blah you know. And, uh, and then one of the other reasons is that my face is wildly asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't have resting bitch face. I have resting cubist painting face. Like I am so, <laughs> no, seriously. And I thought like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at I need see. to keep mm. my face in constant motion before I start looking like I'm, I mean, I am all off angles, like I really am. Uh, um, and I thought like if I'm, if, if my face is fixed, that like you'd be able to see it all. But then I got these huge furrows between my eyebrows that like you could literally, you could plant potatoes in. Like you wouldn't need an allotment. You could just use the furrows between my eyebrows. And it made me look really narky. Like it made me look really disapproving. And I thought, feck this. So I got Botox. I love it, you know. And and then people were saying, oh, God, you look so, so young. Like what skincare do you use? And I was thinking, I use the skincare of going to the person every six months and getting the needles in my face. How can I tell them that without... But anyway, I said it and the world didn't end. And, but yeah, coming back to, to that, like when we're young, well, I suppose, unless we've experienced something, do we have any right to comment ever? Does a woman of 27 have the right to say, I'll never have Botox, mm. you know? Or like, or does a man of 27 have a right to say women should never have Botox? Yeah. You know, because until you have been the person who suddenly has the potatoes growing between her eyebrows, you don't know how bad that feels yeah. until you're feeling it. And also, I love the thing that she changed her mind in public, because that's another thing that has become forbidden in public life. You know, you take your position um, whenever, at the age of 
17. You know, you set out your stall and you're expected to defend that. But like life changes, we change, we mature, we experience different things, we rub up against pain that we hadn't expected to. And, and suddenly we find ourselves thinking differently. And then if somebody in public life says something at 17 and then something else at 31, it's like, hypocrite and liar and I refer to you and then they retweet their tweets from like 14 years ago and that aged well and stuff like that and it's just yeah we need to be more reasonable mm. you know I mean people are being cancelled I put it yes. in inverse commas it's so wearying isn't it yeah because I'm waiting to be cancelled yeah have you not been cancelled yet Marion I'm not thought funny. now now I've had many cancellations but the big one hasn't arrived yet but look it's only a matter of time because sooner or later, everyone, yeah, in the future, everyone will be cancelled, <laughs> as Andy Warhol For 15 didn't minutes. Say. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> everyone will be cancelled for 15 minutes, yeah. The cancellation will not be televised. No. Yeah. Listen, tell us about um, the Comedy in Fiction Prize that yes. you started. Because um, I know that those friends of your mother were saying, with the humour now, stop it. But yeah. to me... What a Marion Keys book does is make me laugh and laugh out loud and, and the joy that you bring in. And I'm always banging on about this because Paul Howard and Russell Carroll Kelly and various other people who write really funny books. I don't believe people get the credit for the humour. I think it's very hard to do in a way that's actually real and, and authentic and consistent. I think it's really difficult, but it's not held up there in the way some other things are. So you sort of saw that uh, men were getting a lot of the, the sort of kudos okay. for this. For a couple this kind of things thing. happened simultaneously. Helen Ledger, who is um, a stand up comedian, and, and, a, you know, and a fabulous woman, um, she got annoyed about the fact that women who write comic novels weren't being recognised. Simultaneously, the, the prize for comic, there's one big prize for comic fiction, it's called the Woodhouse Bollinger Prize. And I write comic novels, and I have never been long listed, never, more, never mind short listed. Um, and over the course of 15 years, Women won it two and a half times. One year they had to share the prize with, with, right. with the, a, an equally funny man. And at, I was at Hey On Why, I think it was probably three years ago now, and people were talking about prizes, and I said, you know, I mind about that one because I am funny. Anyway, that happened to be recorded, and suddenly it went sort of, you <laughs> yeah, know... You were making headlines all yeah, over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, and Around that time, Helen Ledger said, I'm setting up a prize, will you be a judge? And it's only going to be for female novelists mm. who write comic novels. So the first prize was in 2019, and I was one of the judges. And then in 2020, I was the chair of the judges. And it's just, it was such a wonderful thing in a million different ways. Like, I mean, I got to read, a, you know, as chair, I got to read all 90 submissions. And it was such a mixed bag. And I mean, it was just, you know, from literary fiction to, to kind of farcical fiction to, to wonderful wordplay with language. There was such a wealth of novels that, that were offered. And, um, and working with the other judges, like there were five amazing women from various fields of comedy. Mm. And it's it just given me a huge amount of pride to be associated with the prize. I mean, and you know, it's a small prize, we're, we're crowdfunded, we don't have a sponsor, but I think it has, it has made a stand. Yeah. You know, it really has kind of stuck a, a flag for women's comic writing in the ground. And, and I, I think it'll change. It will slowly change people's opinions. Mm. Um, I think you caused a little bit of a furore as well by saying that you were only reading women. You said, I know men write books, but their lives are so limited. <laughs> <laughs> I did say that. No, it was tongue in cheek. However, I was echoing what real men have literally said, not tongue in cheek, about women's books. Um, it did cause, because obviously in these clickbait times, she said wearily, you know, people will lift quotes like that and, and, and present them mm. as if I meant it. Having said that, I mostly read women. And that is, I mean, for two reasons. One is I really like them. And I think there are so many amazing women writing at the moment, like 
established authors and new authors. I mean, I never have time to read as much as I want to, mm. even though I read an awful lot. Um, there's so much to read, and I love that. Um, and also because men, books written by men, still outsell books written by women um, in huge amounts because male readers will almost never read novels written by women. Like they'll do, you, you know, you roll out your Hilary Mantels or your Kate Atkinsons. You know, there are a couple of, of women that have been kind of scrubbed up and presented as, you know, this is fine. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is palatable for the sophisticated male reader, <laughs> you know. But most, they just won't because they have been socialized mm. into thinking that books by women are about romances or things that just aren't important. Um, I was uh, talking to Nick Hornby recently, and he said a very interesting thing about when he wrote How to Be Good. He, he, he wrote a, the narrator as a woman, woman yeah. for the first time, and it was because exactly that. He just found himself finding that uh, men's struggles and things were very much internal, and that he found that women face more obstacles and external things to kind of that are more interesting to write about. So he started writing about women because he, of that thing that he found women's lives more interesting but he also said something else that i thought was really good and it was about popular writing so he was you're obviously very popular and nick hornby's very popular and sometimes there's a snootiness about that and uh, he doesn't care about that at all because he says popularity wins every time okay you might be overlooked for the booker you might ha get some snooty reviews in the times or wherever else but you know, all the best people, all the most successful people in history were popular in their day. If you think about Shakespeare, Dickens, um, Aretha Franklin or Jane Austen or any of these. And I love that idea because we've talked a lot recently about the snobbery around say what you do sometimes, people not appreciating it as much. But where do you, what do you feel about that now? Have you kind of moved on your thinking on that? Oh, I don't know because I don't like being patronised. And I don't see why I should have to swallow it. Just because there are rules that I didn't make and that are, you know, that there are categories that I'm not, not able to fit in. Um, I, I honestly feel that the whole popular literary thing you could almost put the blueprint over the male-female divide. You know, I think when books are made fun of, they're usually books by women. Um, it's difficult because personally, I feel incredibly grateful for the readers I have. Um, and I feel so lucky that I'm able to write the books I do and, and I suppose I generate my own respect. You know, I'm very proud of what I do. But I really don't, I don't, I don't think it should be allowed pass somebody being snide about other people's books simply because they don't fit into a category or into a way of writing that somebody has deemed is acceptable. It's like, I've read an awful lot of rubbish literary books and nobody, you know, and I've let them be. You know, I haven't come after them. You know, I haven't slagged them off in public. It's still that thing of, who elected them, the, the arbiters of what's good and bad? And until they shut up, I don't think popular writers should turn the other cheek. And I don't know if that's controversial or not. It's just I'm bored with being patronised. And I, I'm not speaking personally really anymore. I speak, I feel like I'm talking on behalf of a huge cohort of writers. Mm. Is that a bad answer, Roisin? No, it's a very good answer. It's excellent. Yeah, I, I think, think it's I've very got, clear. I've got too old to pretend to not mind. Mm. Absolutely. Fair enough.
Let's talk about Between Ourselves because oh, you and yeah. Tara Flynn have this amazing radio show that uh, was, you've had a first season, season of it, it was really popular and it's been commissioned for a second one. Yes, it's been the most, do you know one of those things that kind of happens, it starts off small and you think, I don't know, will Anthony ever come of it? Um, yeah, this lovely man, Steve Doherty is his name, knows Tara kind of from the, the comedy circuit. And he is the, the man who produces the David Sedaris books on Radio 4. And like it's a hugely successful um, series of series that he does. And uh, he read some of my nonfiction and he just thought, maybe I don't know with this work. And he got in touch with me and he said, would you be agreeable, you know, if I, if I pitched to BBC Four? And I thought, there is no way on earth Radio Four would ever have me. I thought, work away, you know, via Condias, like, you know, <laughs> open to the universe, but really not expecting anything. And they said yes. And, and it was just, it was really small. It was me, Tara and Steve. You know, we worked from my nonfiction, like we did four shows with a live audience. And it was just... Do you know when some you, you know that feeling when you yeah. get with the hairs all and it was a magical thing, mm. and it went out uh, just over a year ago. It got huge ratings and it got great reviews, and and then it was re oh yeah, and then it was recommissioned for the second series, and then they reran it. And as Steve said, it's it's you know radio moves slowly apparently, you know, but to have you know a series out, a repeat, mm. and a new commission. Is, is kind of unheard of and and it is just and you know I suppose another lovely thing is you know to have two Irish women on Radio 4 yeah has been, it has felt very oh it's it felt very endorsy <laughs> you know it has felt validatory really validatory yeah <laughs> it has been lovely working with both of them yeah and it's just us you know, there's no big team or anything. Mm. I mean, obviously, Tony, my husband, is so... He is the person that I would always get advice from and, and you know, use as a soundboard. But it was it's just one of those little gem things that mm. just... Yeah, it's been gorgeous. Really, really lovely. Great. I'm going to come to a couple of questions from people who've sent them in. OK. Um, but also... Tell me about a couple of books you've read during lockdown because you talked about your creativity being slightly stifled. But yeah. how has your reading been? Because I think reading has been such an escape for people in the, in the last seven or eight months. Yeah, people have been reading twice as much as they would normally. I've read so many great books. Um, there's a book called Lovers and Writers by an American writer called Lily King. I cannot tell you how much I adored <laughs> it. Like, I adored it so much. And you know, when you, you read something you love and then you discover that they have a backlist. So I, I'm reading her stuff as well. Um, the new Louise O'Neill is a marvel. It's called After the Silence and it's it's such a mature book. Like I've loved her earlier books. Um, reading the new Tana French at the moment. I mean, I I I devour everything she written she writes. I mean, she is just so great. Um, an American writer called Britt Bennett. She's mm. written, uh, she's a, an American, an African-American writer. It's a book called, um, oh God, forgive my head. Um, the first one's called The Vanishing. This is the second half. Um, they're such great books. Um, yeah. It's been a great time for books. And when can we expect the next Marion Keys and what is it? <laughs> um, I, uh, it's, well, it's allegedly February 2021. Um, Wow, and that's uh, it's a far away away. I know, but I am no, so. No, it feels far away. It feels very close. What do I mean that? No, I 22. think you mean twenty two. I do. I'm so sorry <laughs> I was about that. Excited. No, I was oh thinking, Jesus! Wow. Oh, could you imagine? Thank you for that. <laughs> Bad at sums. Um, it's a, it's a sequel. Um, yeah, it's the first real sequel I've ever done, and it's a sequel to Rachel's Holiday. Which is uh, just, oh my God, yeah. there's going to be riots in the bookshops, I think, when that comes out. It's, do you know, I mean, it's just, it's delicious writing it. Like, it's just lovely being back with those characters. Yeah. Well, come quickly to the questions. Caroline Murphy asked, do you have a favourite character in Grown Ups? Oh my God, I love Nell, which is the, she's the... Um, the millennial. the millennial, yeah. I love Johnny as well, the the eldest husband. 
I just, I feel so sorry for him. He's such a kind of a handsome, twinkly alpha on the outside. And he is just riddled with insecurities and doubts and his wife earns more than him and he has to do all the housework. And you know, yeah. um, I like him because he is so vulnerable despite everything. I liked them all though. And we'll end with this one from Gronia White. Um, she's asking what the best part of writing Grown Ups was, but also maybe what's the, what's the, what has been your favorite book to write so far? Um, you know, in a way, Grown Ups was, it was, it was, it was a pleasure to write because I knew the plot. I mean, I had an, an overall kind of, didn't know the details and everything. I loved having all the characters to play with, like in all the different, yeah, I think the range of characters, having them to play with was probably the most, the most exciting part. Then there was the second part of the question you asked me. I was me just already. asking which of your, which of your novels has been your favourite yourself? I don't, I mean, I, I wouldn't really have a favourite, although I'm very, I'm feeling really good about the one I'm writing at the moment. It's just, being in that world is really enjoyable. Back with the Walshes. Back with the Walshes. Back with Rachel and Luke. <laughs> yeah. As long as I don't ruin it. You won't ruin it, Marion Keys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.